Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. We're going into um, part four now with Albert Patrick. Thanks, Albert. Cheers, um, mate. Albert, where we're sitting at the moment is uh, just on the Thames Estuary. Uh, it's a little bit of interesting uh, location for you. Yeah, it's very interesting. For, as I said, two years I've been uh, sat doing this review, and if you look out my front window, to the left is Retterton, just over the hill, is the crime scene. You can see that in the distance on the left. You pan round to South End, and South End is connected because that's where uh, the Essex boys had some nightclubs and uh, lots of connections there uh, where Tate was living in uh, with uh, Nipper Ellis. Uh, and then you come round again to the middle, can't quite see it, but in the distance is Clacton, and Clacton is connected because that's where Michael Steele lived. That's where they were arrested uh, on the 13th of May, 96. And then if you pan right the way around to the right, in the distance, but you can't quite see it, is Holland. Uh, and uh, that's where uh, the rib was used to cross the North Sea to pick up the cannabis, according to Nichols' account. Yes, so quite an interesting in, intriguing that yeah. I can see four <laughs> crime scenes <laughs> without moving an inch. So, so quite we're, relevant. We're going to go into the questions and answers now, which are the, the viewers have put over to us, Albert. So if you're happy to go into them, we can fire some questions at you. Certainly, let's go. Okay, so first questions come from Donna Maiden. She asks, it is well documented that Pat Tate and Tony Tucker had their phones on them that night. We are told that Pat received a call while supposedly in the company of Michael Steele. We know that mobile phone evidence was used in court, but the same research done into Tucker and Tate's mobiles, mobiles and their approximate location at the alleged time of the murder? Uh, difficult one, uh, because I haven't seen all the material, but let me explain how I see it. You've got Tate's phone, which received a call from Sarah Saunders at 1844. And Nichols says that, that according to Steele's account, when he talked to him after the murders, they were just turning into the top of the lane. That's what the jury heard. That's what the judge said, and that's what Nichols says happened. For it's a minute less than that drive down to the crime scene, and they're still on the phone for three minutes, four minutes, talking to Sarah. So that is what the jury heard. The defence did not have the opportunity of checking uh, Wooms's phone when uh, Nichols says that you got a call down the lane. Park that for a second because it's relevant to the phone on Wooms and Nichols. Back to Pat Tate. In relation to disclosure, nothing else is disclosed after 1844. Now, I just do not believe that no one has been in touch, either leaving a message or uh, on his phone to say, well, the restaurant's booked. You've got a girl waiting back at uh, the house, Claire waiting for him to go out to dinner. So are we honestly believe that there was no other call. So that hasn't been disclosed. And more importantly, the defence, uh, uh, so I'll start again, the 1844 call says it still was in the Range Rover with them. And we know from the work I've done on the timeline is that they were only at the Hungry Horse pub. And do we honestly believe that Tucker Tate and Rolf allowed Michael Steele to get into the back of that Range Rover with a bag, with boiler suit on and with gloves, yeah, plastic gloves on, and then drive 10 minutes down to the crime scene. And why go all the way to the Hungry Horse? Why just didn't stop at a pub that's much nearer and get on with the deal that's going to be taking place? Yeah. It just doesn't stack up for me. There's just no reality around that having taken place. As far as Tucker's phone is concerned, 
uh, there was only messages in and his last call if I remember rightly was 1707 when there was a Mick Bowman call took place so I think that was the last call for him lots yeah. of messages left on his answer phone after the alleged time of death so yeah, yes the analysis has been done but for me to be happy and understand what's happened with the phones I need to look at the raw data yeah. I need to do analysis around uh, the calls that were made and, and not have any missed out. You've got to have them all in front of you and make a judgment as to... And of course, it doesn't mean to say that if my phone's used, it's me on the other end of the line, does it? No, so, uh, or, or where I am, or who I'm in company with. So, you know, a, a, a very much a grey area that I've identified and, and, and David and, and Birds have identified that there's something not right. And even David Bristol says it. He's expert. The schedules are not right. And when did the police obtain them? And who got them? You know, it was rumoured that they, they were, that still was being looked at by customs. Uh, and, and when did they make their application? So lots of questions to be answered. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on from there. How about uh, David Rock asks, on the night of the murders after the alleged time of death of 7pm, the three were spotted at the Fortune and War pub with another man who the landlord knew but didn't name. Who was that man and why did the police not follow it up? Good question, because guess what? I've answered that in part three. Yeah. Yeah. I picked up on that way, way back on the Bernard O'Mahomey website and there are messages and actions there that have not been dealt with properly. Hopefully that, uh, the, the author of that question will be well pleased that we picked up yeah, on it. Yeah, picked it up already. Uh, from the same guy, David Rock, is there any other evidence that they were alive after 7 p.m.? Another good question, because I think I've answered that one <laughs> yeah. reasons well. There, there, it's that magic word, evidence. Yeah, strong, hard evidence. There are, for me, lines of inquiry, uh, sightings that were not dealt with properly, uh, and the one that we've identified, and the defence got it way, way back, is the, the sighting of the Range Rover, uh, with Tucker Tater, I believe, at the Turnpike, uh, we've all got Carpenter who gave uh, his evidence of the pub in Rotary where he said he saw Rolf and one other and you've got the, the sightings at the two pub you're talking about. So that's all after 7pm. Yeah. In relation to 7pm, the only person who's, who, can, who says they were dead and killed at 7pm is Darren Nichols. Yeah. There's no f uh, medical evidence, there's no forensic evidence, there's no eyewitness, there's, there's nothing to say that they were 100% dead. And just because they don't answer the phone, don't tell me that they're dead. That's Come smart. on. <laughs> you forget your phone that's in your bag or your handbag that's in a restaurant. Yeah, come on, yeah. get in the real world. Yeah. It depends what company you're in a certain course. Yeah, you probably course, wouldn't yeah. want to answer at that time. Yeah, so, so that is um, where we are in relation to that one. Yeah, so just a few questions here now um, about the Range Rover itself on the night of the murders. So. Was there, or why was there no ice or snow on the vehicle? Was the ignition left on? And was there fuel still left in the motor? Well, let me do that back to the first one because that's going to take the longest. Yep. Yes, there was fuel. The tank was a third fuel. The ignition was off and the key was in the ignition. So those two are easy. Yep. The big one is frost and snow. Uh, and I've looked long and hard at that. There's a man called uh, Adrian Runacres who was appointed by the CCRC to investigate the lack of frost on the Range Rover. And when you look at what he's saying, at 7 o'clock it's all an anomaly. Yeah, he's got the temperatures, done a long report, and that, that's the bottom line. That's what he said. He, he can't really, really answer it. But for those reasons, and the reasons are scientific I think if I use that word because the trees are up close to the Range Rover yeah it would have uh, kept it warm and wouldn't have done the engine running yeah, for a long time and the heat from the body so uh, lo lots of reasons put forward to deal with seven o'clock my question is okay hear what you say about seven o'clock and I've asked Mr. Runacres indirectly tell me about 12 o'clock you know would it have made a difference if, in relation to lack of snow and lack of ice, if it was 
12 o'clock, 12.30, 1 o'clock, when they were killed, yeah, or whatever time, and is that the reason? I have personally spoken to Peter, Peter Thabel, the farmer, and he, <coughs> he says he had to put hot water on his windscreen to get it clean. Now, is that because it was out in the open moor and his farmyard and 500 yards away there's a difference? What I would have done is tested it. It's is, is gone and put, yeah, go and put the range over there with the temperature right and, and see if it would have made a difference. Can't do it now because all the trees have been taken away. So not very satisfactory, but uh, there's got to be a reason for it. And uh, uh, the closer to 8 o'clock that they were killed, I think, is the reason. Yeah, that makes sense. 8 a.m. that is. Um, Richard G asks, do you think all three men could have been the target? Well, the Crown's case is that, that Tate was the, the main target because of the bad cannabis deal. I would suggest that from what we've uncovered and what Jasper says, that Tucker was the main target. And when you look at Rolf, what is Rolf? He was described as a gopher, definitely involved in the Whitaker murder. I honestly believe because of their behaviours, all three were subject of uh, concerned by lots of people in the criminal world to say that they were uh, getting out of order. But I think when you look at the, the money situation, and I've said already, the key people uh, based on the Jasper account, that's more more in, in keeping with how I have experienced in my time as a servant cop. Yeah, I suppose as well, from a sort of point of view, if they're going to take one out, they may as well take out the whole pack and not leave any loose ends in there to that. Yeah, you just think about it. If there was a rock between Steel and Tate, yeah, why take out Tucker and Rolf? Come on, the rock, it's a bad cannabis deal. The money's owed in relation to those two. They've had a rock. Yeah, why take out the other two? It just, just doesn't make sense, does it? Right, so in relation to that, for me, that's not a strong motive. And that needed needed more investigation yeah uh, and, and 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 it's just sorry but i i listen i i i wasn't there and i don't know 150 percent what happened but i'm just putting my experience to what i see the situation yes yeah. um ron m asks could it be possible that they were murdered at a different location and been dumped in the lane well, that's intriguing because that's the second time I've been asked that question. There is anonymous information into TMI that says that's what happened. And, and I have uh, spent some time actually looking at that being possible. I don't think it happened, but it could have. But only three uh, uh, cartridges were fired, one, two, three, out wherever. Uh, and then the vehicle would have been had to be driven to down the lane, and then the other five were shot 100% from the crime scene because of where the glass is and where they were found. They haven't gone around and dropped them. Yeah. We're we're satisfied that the back right hand door is the principal position that the gunman was in. Then he's gone round the front, and he's had to go round the front where one of them had been discharged and fire two shots into the back window. We've had an, an expert uh, test you know, the situation, and that is, as far as we're concerned, what happened. The only reason for them being shot elsewhere and being moved down the lane is because where they were shot would have brought attention to whoever was responsible. Say it was on somebody's farmyard, uh, sorry, on somebody's farm, or on a building or whatever. I don't think that happened. But I haven't ignored it, uh, and uh, I'm keeping an open mind on it. Okay, moving on. Matt Johnson asks, the three of them were under surveillance, and there was a warrant out for Pat's arrest for the incident at the pizza place. Why was he allowed to go free, and surveillance ended the day before the shootings? It's just too quick. You know, it, there wouldn't have been a want because it would have taken you, well, well, when they say there wasn't a, there was a want, well, if there was one, I haven't seen it on a copy. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> you've got to investigate it, you've got to take statements. And as I understand it, Essex Police told the victim of the quality of the people that he'd assaulted him. 
and he, he didn't want to press charges. So in relation to the assault and the pizza up, that's all happened too quickly. If it had been left to drag on, then you would have asked that question and a very valid one. But just the night before or the night before that, just too quick. Yeah. And then on the surveillance point, I think my understanding is it was only static surveillance, that observation on Rolf's address, uh, and, but they hadn't been following them. Well, we haven't seen any evidence to, to suggest that they had been under surveillance 24-7, but would they have been under surveillance on a snowy night at midnight or even 7 o'clock? They'd, they'd Never know. It, wouldn't they, as yeah. well, with uh, someone following? Yeah, well, you would have technical, I'm sure. You, the vehicle would have... Uh, so more the surveillance would have been of watching their properties of them coming and going and yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. And, and also, you, you, would, you would expect the phones to be connected uh, and, and obviously what had been done on that. So I, I, I think they were, they'd been, their, their names had been brought to the attention of the drug squad and I do believe there was an operation on them, but I, I don't think it was, it was active on the night of the murder. Yeah. Do you believe they were down the lane that night unarmed, completing a test run for a planned deal? It's what the motive's all about, isn't it? And, and if you look at the detail in the trial and what was said and what you're reading on social media, uh, the ruse, the lure down the lane, was a drugs deal, because that's what people have said. And it was an alleged aeroplane going to be brought in by Mickey Steele. Well, the aeroplane's out the window because there's no way you're going to land an aeroplane in snow or, or you're going to land it yeah. where there's lakes around you and the weather conditions, the aeroplane wouldn't have got off the ground. So the aeroplane landing there, aeroplane drop is a, is a good point, uh, but the gate is locked yeah, and somebody would have had to have their key and there was no key on the victims. Okay, the killer could have had a key, but... You know, they're trapped, aren't they? And if my yeah. theory is there was a second vehicle involved, they're trapped between the five bar gate and the vehicle behind, yeah, which is tightened the position for them to get away. Uh, so, no, no, I, I don't know what the lure was or who got them down the lane, but if you could uncover who that was, you can then start putting the jigsaw together in relation to what I think is the strongest motive, which is money owed uh, by Tucker. Um, Chris Peacock asks, have the high-tech footprint into the snow that led from the lane back up to the farm been investigated? And could this back up Jasper's statement? Well, the crime scene for me and the, the lifting of uh, foot marks was too slow. And again, uh, speaking to Peter, the farmer, he says when he arrived down the lane at 8 o'clock, it was covered in snow. Yeah, there was not, no track. You, there was obviously tracks underneath the snow, but it was covered in a light snow. Uh, and from what he saw, there was no break of the ice. And then when you look at when the police arrive, it's about three hours before the first photograph's taken. Or two, yeah, three hours, 11 o'clock, arrived at eight. 11 o'clock, the first photograph is taken. And you can see that shoe mark, the high-tech trainer, at the rear offside door. One only, no others found, either going that way, then the Jasper account in front of the Range Rover, or going back up the lane and going back towards the farm. There's only one trainer marked found, no others. Yeah. Now, have they been missed with all the trampling that's gone on with all those police officers I've seen at the crime scene? Yeah. Uh, and, and people walking up and down the lane that they shouldn't have done. But the bigger one for me is, come on, the size 12 wellies coming down the lane and two pairs going back up again. Not one single size 12 welly bootmark on that lane. And that, that says quite a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, of course, yeah. It's a big, uh, big part of it. Right, moving on. Lee Scott asks, what do you think about one of the farmer's statements about the rear passenger being sat behind the driver? Well, I've sat in that Range Rover. I'm a big geezer, the same as Tate. And I'll tell you what, there's no room for anybody to sit on the other side of me when that happened. And to get in, I've had to climb in. Yeah. yeah? So sitting, I, so as far as the back is concerned, from what I've seen from the photographs and the sketches, he was sitting in the most comfortable part, right in the middle, because you've also got two big lumps in the front as well, 
where the seats are going to be right back. Yeah, so you've got one foot behind the driver, one foot left behind the front passenger, and you could sit and sway. And if you look at where he's been shot, shot in the chest, head's gone back, and his head's lying on the rear near side uh, door, and then uh, the killer has gone round the other side and shot him through there. So the farmer, and, and you, the, the photographs have been on, 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 the, on the, so you miss me, they've been public, they're terrible that they were put up there, but they've been on there for a long time now and still available. So, and he's looking through uh, dirty windows as well, and it's just coming out of darkness and he's never seen him again. So, listen, I've spoken to him, right? What he said, yeah, is what happened, as far as I'm concerned. He was there, and, and he's a lovely guy, just yeah. telling the truth. Yeah. So we're going to ask some questions now connected to the case. We have a number of questions asking whether the reported murders could be connected in some way. So Lloyd Jones asked, could the killer be linked to the Maxine Arnold and Goodham case? Well, I... I've reviewed that case as a as a Serb and civilian cop, uh, a civilian officer in the Met. Forget how long ago it was. There are named people in that who have never been arrested, uh, charged, or convicted. <clears throat> they may be connected because they know each other, but I don't think there's any evidence to say that's connected. Uh, next question from Amanda Green. She asked. Are the Lovers Lane murders thought to be linked to the Essex Boy case in any way? I think that's the same as the Epping Forest, Goodman right. and Arnold. So there's no evidence. I've reviewed and saw nothing, but I haven't, I haven't seen everything. From Paul Vickers, he asked, has any links been made to Linda Millard's disappearance or to Terry Ball? I've read the information on uh, an inquiry on that. There, there's no evidence, but... Ball was uh, spoken to, I think, wasn't arrested, and his premises, which are close to Rettendon, literally opposite uh, the wheat shift in that part, uh, had his house searched with uh, his permission. Uh, we've got the sad case where Linda Millard is missing, uh, uh, presumed dead, I think she probably is dead. Her car was found on one of the uh, spots in Bristol area, off the channel there, uh, and just her shoes and her car. The information was that, that she'd overheard her partner Terry Ball talking about something, believed the murders, and that he'd locked her out of the room. She'd gone and told friends, and, and there was a potential line of inquiry, but there's no evidence to say they were connected. Doesn't mean they say they weren't, but yeah. there's nothing that I would be raising as a high priority action to deal with. So John Sharp asks, do you believe John Marshall's murder was connected to the Essex Boys case <clears throat> as he was in the same friendship circle and a Range Rover, the same as his, was spotted the day before the murders in the lane? Very interesting question again. I wished I had kept the John Marshall murder on my patch in South London because I, I would be much closer to finding out what happened. John Marshall was found uh, in his Range Rover in a bale of hay on my patch in South London, Sydney. I was the head of CID, and between Kent, Met, me, and Essex, the right decision was made, I believe, to take it back to uh, Essex, where he was reported missing, for them to get on and deal with. John Marshall is connected because he was in the same circles. The family will say he was not a drugs dealer, I don't know. But what I have done, I've spoken to the SIO, Senior Investigating Officer, in relation to that murder, and he believes he uncovered who had done it, but there was no evidence to support that theory. And the names that he put up are indirectly connected, but not directly, i.e. moving in the same circles, yeah. uh, having been in the same area, same age group and the same associates. John Marshall is also mentioned in Rettendon, uh, as, as you said, is part of that circle. So, again, no evidence, but uh, Jock Gamble says that he thinks he identified who was responsible, and it wasn't any of those involved so far that I have seen in Yeah. Uh, moving on, Gary Mason asks, 
What is the likelihood of Jack Holmes ever clearing his name? Everyone can see he was an innocent man, so why did he still carry the name of a murderer? That's not for me to answer, sadly. Uh, will he ever clear his name? I really do hope he can. My disappointment in relation to Jack Wombs is that when I started doing this review, I wanted, through the defence, to talk to him. That never happened. Thank God he's out in parole now, and part of his conditions are that he doesn't talk to the press, and he sees me as part of the press because I'm appealing to the press for help to solve it. Walking through the Michael Steele uh, in review, who is he's still inside, obviously, I hope that we'll have uncovered enough because if you prove Michael Steele innocent, then the knock-on effect is that Jack Williams will be innocent as well. And I'll harp on about, I've used that before, and I'll say again, Jack Williams did not pull the trigger on the shotgun that killed Tucker Tate and Rolf for all the reasons I've said before. Just not right. Yeah. And it's not, here's me sitting here 26 years and saying he didn't do it. I could be wrong, I know that, but you've got to give me some credit yeah, for my experience around uh, contract killings, assassinations, and evidence that, that we've uncovered that ain't there that has been disproved on the Nichols account. If there had been fingerprints, forensic, CCTV, the only thing is he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, I, the wheat chief, picking up a beating up old VW Passat for Nichols, much like I've said before, Rachel McKell and Stagg and other cases I could talk about. So I'll say no more then. Yep. One day the truth will come out. We've just got a few questions regarding Billy Jasper now. So Kenny Hoy asked, if you believe Patsy Clark and Billy Jasper's theory, has a search been carried out for the weapon in that location where it was said to have been <coughs> dumped, including an underwater search? Well, I've got no power to authorise anybody to go and search uh, anywhere for an exhibit. That would have to be the police, nor the people to do it. Uh, I, I'm a, a slightly confused on that. My, and I'd need to refresh my memory, but from what I have read, the firearms that were taken <coughs> by Mr. D were returned through the same channels as they were picked up on. So. There was no dumping of the firearm. I did think that myself, actually. To If you'd done a murder, just dump the weapon, it's going to be found. So, If, if, the, if the Uno went in a shredder, I a cruncher, then there's a fair chance the gun's gone with it. Yeah. So Jan Tanner asks, is it true Billy Jasper had confessed to crimes he had nothing to do with in the past, and this is why his statement was not looked into? I've seen that mentioned. I, I need to refresh my memory out in more detail and, and dig that out, whether it was social media or any of the papers uh, that I have been uh, given access to. This is all part of the, the whole picture with Jasper, that the fact that absolutely nothing was done. And if it had been the fact that he was, uh, you know, confessing the crimes he hadn't done, then, then that, that, that would come out, I would like to think, in that investigation. But don't forget, I have spoken to two officers who had dealt with him historically, and they didn't give me that impression. Yeah. And, there's, and, and if he was talking about crimes that he didn't do, well, let's look at the evidence and see what they were. Uh, just don't totally ignore his account. Yeah. Um, next question from Zane Bowers. Did Jasper actually say he heard gunshots, as they would have been heard from where he was meant to have been waiting? I thought it was the other way around. I thought Jasper was asked that question and he never heard any gunshots. Nichols was asked that question and he said he didn't hear any gunshots. And from where they were, I can understand that neither of them would have heard. Nichols is up over the hill down in Meadowlow, so you've got the guns being fired in that direction and he's over there. And you've got the guns being fired in that direction and Jasper is way over there. A question from Jason Townsend. It has recently been said that Billy Jasper did not name Jesse Gow and the assassin or anyone else involved in the murders. Is this true? 100% false. He did. Yeah. 
Uh, but it didn't come out, it, 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 Jesse Gill came out of the trial, you know, he was allowed to say it. Uh, he didn't name Patsy Clark because he was still alive at the time, if I remember yeah. rightly. Uh, and he had to give Mr. D for others, uh, and obviously himself. So he definitely, I've, as I said, I've seen the interview, I've seen his, his, uh, his 12 page uh, admission, and also the, the R38's report that the uh, uh, interviewing officer put into the Holmes account. Uh, so he did, full stop. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> right, there's a few cr questions here on corruption. So, Casual Chancy, that must be his YouTube name, asks Do you think the investigation was incompetent due to corruption within the force? And did you find any corruption during your in investigation that has a worthy note? Right, corruption in Redden is a chapter on its own. And I don't particularly want to take up too much of your time, Lee, and, and let people listen to me. I did cover it slightly in interview number three. Uh, in the 90s, early 80s, late 80s, 90s, corruption was rife mm. in quite a few police forces. I've got personal experience of it. Some of my staff were corrupt or were charged and convicted. Yeah, so I know quite a bit about corruption across the whole of my 30 years policing experience. And in relation to Rettendon, there, it, there were two inquiries being run, uh, and, and in particular the handler of Nichols, you know, and that was six years and it got nowhere. And Nichols never came to give evidence against him, you know, even in the discipline hearing. So lots of huge concerns around the fact that Police officers, if they were at it and were corrupt, hadn't been convicted. And that, to me, is, is, is the single point I would like to make. Something not right. Uh, and listen, there wasn't everybody in the case. Some, not some good detectives on there who I know myself. Who, so it's not everybody. No. Like one bad apple can bloody yeah. spoil the rest. Cool. Of everybody else. Our next question from Stu Pinnock. Why, there, why has there been no follow-up on Lizzie Fletcher's statement? The police officer who took it suggested that Lizzie knew more than she was letting on. Has the TMI team managed to interview her, or do you have plans to? The lady detective who made that comment after Lizzie Fletcher made her statement is, mixed, is excellent. You know, she's done the right thing. She's taken the statement and, and put her thoughts on an R. I forget what the number was, but she's put it in the system. No backup. As I say, Lizzie Fletcher has never been spoken to again. Yes, we at Team and I want to talk to her, but we haven't got there. And another key witness around a similar subject, which is a VW poll, Andrew Reynolds. We would like him to come forward and talk to us, just to have an understanding of what happened that day in relation to the VW poll and repairs and collection and, and pick up point. Because it will have a huge input in the timeline if we can show that the vehicle was there at 18 or 12 and it was there at 1700, 1800, 1900 throughout the evening. So that's an ongoing line of inquiry that uh, we, we, uh, we are very active on. Yeah. Uh, moving on to the next question. Zoe Ball asks, there is a theory that the killings were a police assassination. Could this be a possibility or that Leah Betts' dad was somehow involved? Well, Leah Betts' dad, as you know, was a, uh, an inspector, a retired inspector. And for what I've seen of the dad, uh, he, he wasn't responsible uh, for Tucker Taylor Roth's mother. Uh, did people try to do it because uh, Tucker and his associates were wrapped round the nightclub and that's where she got the ecstasy from, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, corruption across the board, again that's, that's, that's the chapter that we uh, really uh, have concerns about and what, what actually did happen because we haven't had access to the, the documents and, and the case file in relation to those inquiries. We're, second guessing sometimes of what we think happened uh, and and Lee Betts, he's been on social media and talk and he comes across as a, a dad yeah. who's lost his little one yeah of course. Uh, and 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 for me yeah that he wasn't responsible so definitely 
Yeah. It's quite right to look at him as a suspect, but I don't think he was wrong. Yeah. Uh, question from Don Matthews. He asks, what are your honest thoughts that a retired team of detectives have to continue investigating this due to Essex Police closing the case that stinks of corruption and a man serving a life sentence for a crime he may have not committed? You remember I said in my first and second interview, Essex Chief Constable, please listen to what I've got to say. Please allow me to come and brief you. Please allow me to review the Retterton murder investigation. What it needs is an independent review. I do believe there's enough justification for a reinvestigation. He tells me to go down the CCRC route. I'll tell you now, I'm not confident that that route will uncover the truth of the 6th of December 95. Simple as that. Yeah. Uh, next question from Chris Pika. He asked, did Wolfgang Bird, Darren Nichols' handler, have any rumoured or confirmed association with any organised crime families linked to the case? Personally, I don't know. I, I sense that the contacts that we're making with in Essex Police, uh, and if we looked at the file for Apache, we would be able to answer that, but I'm not at liberty. Uh, to discuss that here today. Yeah. But, but it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, same guy again, Chris Peaker. He asked, in Ivan Dibley's own words, Mick Steele was the prime suspect from day one. It is standard practice for the police, sorry, is it standard practice for the police not to interview their prime suspect as soon as possible, or is this considered unusual? That question is exactly why I want to sit down with Ivan Dibley and just over a coffee or even over a pint and say, Ivan, this is what I have uncovered. And I would like to think that Ivan has done his research on me uh, and, and I won't bore you with it, but I've got a hell of a lot of experience and I've been around a long time. And, and like Michael Steele, I'm getting bloody old. Uh, Ivan, mate, you've made a mistake. You've been hooded by Nichols, and there's just too much on the record in case that wasn't done, that should have been done. He's a good guy. He's an honest, good man who did a great job as a servant cop in Essex. But he was, in my view, just not the right person to deal with this. He was close to retirement, you know, uh, uh, and he should have done things that that for me a bread and butter off a contract, triple murder, heavy people involvement investigation. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Jason Martin asked, Billy Blundell made a statement in an interview that a warning had been given to Pat. Do you think that this links him to knowing who the killer was or that he knew that the murders were being planned? If Billy Blunder was alive today, I would be knocking on his door. But I honestly believe he knew exactly what was coming. He, and he knew Pat Tate, and he gave Pat Tate the warning. Pat, sort it out, mate, or you could be in line with the rest. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, Billy Blunder knows exactly that he's passed away, what happened, and not in the detail but you could point me in the right direction or confirm, have I got it right? Is it somebody else involved? You know, but, but listen, I've watched his interview. You know, he comes across very sensibly, doesn't he? He's, he's close to the truth, if not the truth. Yeah. Uh, moving on, Steve Allen asks, what are the chances of Mick Steele ever getting released? He's still a Cat A prisoner. What is your opinion on his involvement? I've answered that, I think, in, in, quite, in interview number, number three, three, but I'll just repeat it again. Yeah, he is totally and utterly frustrated, disappointed, gutted, not impressed, uh, obstinate, not that other word, man who is 79 years of age, a political category A prisoner in Monster Mansion and it cannot be right, can it? 
I'm on it, this cannot be right. When the guy who allegedly pulled the trigger and killed the three of them is out, yeah, and okay, perhaps he, it was a better model prisoner than Michael Steele is, but this whole case needs a serious, serious review. If somebody constantly pleads their innocence, yeah, and uh, somebody like me, and I'll, I'll blow on trumpet, it needs to be brought in on a one-off and say, okay, have a look at what we've got and get an honest, experienced, professional report as to what took place. Simple as that. And, it, and this is what this means, seriously. Yeah. Uh, moving on, Gavin Cushion asked, <clears throat> You mentioned Mad Mickey Bowman in your last interview. Was he more involved than just selling the gun and anything to do with the setting up? I like that question. 1707 call, come on mate, and then suddenly the next day he's ringing up, you okay, call me, you okay, call me, you okay, call me. Something not right there. I want to know about the Uzi submachine gun. Now there's lots of questions for Mickey. He gets naked, yeah, and he's, out, and he's interviewed and he gets charged. And, and all the ramifications. I, I see him a little bit like Nipper Root. And Nip, who's that one again? Ellis. He used to be my boss, Nipper Ellis. You know, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, a rascal. <clears throat> he probably knows a damn sight more. Is he involved? Is he part of the lure down the lane? Could be. But if he'd been out of prison because he's locked away up north, he only lived down the road here. And I'll be knocking on his door as well. <laughs> so he's another knock on the door person for me. <laughs> um, just another question here. Have you read the book by Alan Duggan, Who Killed the Essex Boys? Uh, yes. He has it. <laughs> oh, it's still the bottom drawer. I ain't finished it yet, but I cheat and I go to the back. And whoever this gentleman is, Alex Duggan, I don't think that's his real name. I think this is written in a pseudonym. Who is he? Who is Alex Duggan? Whoever you are, mate, bring me up. I want to talk to you. Simple as that. Some of his thinking is, you know, there's lots of uh, information, <coughs> fact in there that I would like to share with him. He does say at the end though, it was uh, Mickey and Jack that did it. So I would just want to give him my experience. Perhaps he'll write another book after it, but not my <laughs> cup of tea. So yes, the, the message is halfway through it. Um, Scott Perry asked, do you think <coughs> Darren Nichols should now be charged as everyone can see he's a liar and doesn't deserve witness protection? Well, the first thing is you need evidence, you need to prove it. Uh, I, I think there are people in the <coughs> who've been seen already who can actually show that he's lied. Not really <coughs> part of this review. Somebody else needs to look at that and needs to be considered. He's protected at the moment, so I'm assuming. He's part, in, part of the witness protection uh, system and no one can touch him. You can't even talk to him. I would love to talk to him. <laughs> uh, that ain't going to happen. <coughs> but the, the, the right thing to happen, if he has lied, is to come forward now. I know uh, he would probably get locked away. Again, that wouldn't happen. But if he's on his deathbed one day, you know, and he sees... Uh, the, the true light of the 6th of December. You know this? I honestly believe that Steele, Wounds and Nichols did not have a clue of what was going to happen down that lane on the 6th of December. Because the only thing that sucks them in is Nichols' evidence. Nichols is nicked. He's looking after number one. He knows he was down there at 1848 when he uses his phone on his voicemail. He knows that he's called Jack Wounds because he's there collecting his vehicle for him. And he knows that Steele has been there because uh, of because they chatted afterwards, you know, he, he worked, Nichols worked for them. So he was working on the cottage weeks after, days after the murders. So if you look at the Crown's case, if you could just prove that one minute past seven, Tucker Tate and Rolf were alive and elsewhere, then you got nothing. Yeah, it, it, okay, I was down the lane, so what? I was in the pub, so what? Nothing to do with the murders. But then when you look at 
the, the defence around the Jasper account, there's too many questions here I need an answer to. Yeah. And I want to talk to Jasper. Uh, my trouble is, <clears throat> I don't have a warrant card. Is he a witness or is he a suspect or is he both? So, and there's a lot of uh, questions that weren't asked of him that in the cold light of day I would want to do so. So in relation to uh, where we are with that one, time will tell. Uh, you've sort of answered this question, but it's the flip side of what we just asked, so I'll throw it in anyway. Um, Lloyd Jones asked, could Darren Nichols have been a lone paid killer? Shooting was a hobby of his. Yes. So yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. It is possible. But if we can prove the live woman after seven, <laughs> then, then it's a lot of... Yeah. Lot of <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question for Jason Towson. He asked, what evidence is there that Nichols lied about the time of death? Nichols lied, and the time of death I would like to split if, if, he, if he doesn't mind me. Listen, I've looked at his, read his account so many times now, it's just unbelievable. And there's just so many in, uh, discrepancies, lies, he admits lying. So if you look at Nichols as a witness of truth, it ain't there. Yeah. He's a witness of <coughs> fact and fiction. And the defence went on that tack when they gave his cross-examination. So that's Nichols. When you look at the time of death, I'm blaming Essex police for not even attempting to establish the time of death and to do what should have been done is the temperature inside the Range Rover, the temperature of the bodies, and this mad rush to get the victims in the Range Rover off undercover elsewhere. Put a bloody tent up yeah, and take your time at the crime scene and don't walk up and down the lane. Go round there and set up, you know, an in and out, in a corner recording and get on with doing what the experts are good at. And that didn't come to the, 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 the DI in charge. He said it was an unhappy crime scene. Unhappy because the sun's coming out. Well, deal with it, you know. If needs to be put a, a blow machine down there to try and keep the temperature at the right temperature, that would be a bit false. But get in quickly, video it. Why didn't they video it? The COVID. Listen, they missed the, the, the cartridge in the front near side. That was never taken, taking a photograph. They missed the one that was in the glove box. And that fell there because I think it came off the seat and went in there. Couldn't have gone in there. It was almost impossible. So lots of niggling issues for me that uh, just went down right. Yeah. So uh, I'm blaming Essex for not, not, ex you know, getting that question and then, listen, the, the pathologist might not be able to 100% say the time, but it just might have put it in favour of one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. Or if you couldn't do it, then you couldn't do it. At least try, at least do the job. Yeah, of course. Okay, moving on. Kevin from Kevin Hoey. Why is Mr. D's identity not disclosed, disclosed in court and why was it protected? Not sure if I covered that, but quite simple. Jasper would have been given a caution to avoid mis uh, incriminating himself. And the, and the judge ruled it was hearsay. You'll notice that those who passed away were men. But Mr. D wasn't the only one whose true identity wasn't given to the jury. But if he, and I think I've explained that before, I've been in similar circumstances where, as an SIO, you've got to go in the witness box and justify your actions or your non-action. And when you look at the defence's dealing of Jasper, okay, the rule, I think the judge made the right decision, you know, that's the law, and he made the right call. He said, he made those rulings about what Jasper could and couldn't say. But if you put the SIO in the witness box and say, okay, the trouble with this case is the SIO doesn't know about Jasper. <laughs> that's what, the, that's what, what appears to be the case. But anyway, somebody did, yeah? The, the, somebody on that investigation knew about the Jasper account. So you put it in the witness box and you say, in a professional proper wording, 
if you get out what Jasper said, that still has the same impact to the jury. And this is what the defence didn't have. The motive was there. The character of the gunman was there. The ability to provide a, uh, a, a wrong motor vehicle. The connections with all of them. The fact that Redwin, who was dead, who was one of the robbers, was convicted and then appealed and got off. So he's out. He worked for Tucker. Then you come round to Edwards. He worked for Tucker around the other part of the circle and you put it all together without actually naming the people. You could have named Jesse Gill because he's dead. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think you could have, you could have mentioned it. Is it right that people responsible for a robbery on a given date were charged and then they were found not guilty and how much money was stolen? Yeah. You could have said that Tucker had just bought a brand spanking new bungalow for cash and he's driving around in a Porsche. Yeah. Now, Listen, I could be totally wrong. Yeah, I, I mean that, I could be totally wrong. But investigate it. You know, a line of inquiry that was totally ignored. And, and, and that's because I think blinkered and out of depth. Yeah. Two words that, that are coming through to me quite a bit on what I've read and seen. Yeah. Okay, Albert, down to the final question. It's uh, one that everybody's asking us. A lot of people want to know the same answer. Do you think this case will ever truly be concluded and justice served for those that have been caught up in the aftermath of the Rettinger murders? Will the gunmen who pulled the trigger on the 6th of December, at whatever time it was, that was killed Tucker, Tate and Rolf, ever be charged, convicted and sent their life imprisonment? I don't think so. I honestly don't. I haven't seen anything right now. And I said on a previous interview, unless you get three other super grasses to, to give evidence that they actually were there and saw it and did it, I, I don't think it happened. Jasper has actually given the evidence. You know, if he could, if he wanted to and was allowed to be new, can kind of corroborate what he said. That's corroborate with new evidence, not just corroborate his account. Mm -hmm. then there's a possibility. Uh, it, will, it will never be solved. But what I want out of it is for the truth to be uncovered. And we've discussed this before. The truth of the six, and I need the public of Essex help. There are people out there who, who can just come. Please come and tell me what you know about the Redford and Murders. Uh, and, and Jack and Mick deserve even after 27, 26, 23 years imprisonment to have that, 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 that plug unpooled and the relief of knowing that for the time I've been trying, I actually was telling the truth. The big downer for them, as you know, they got sucked into the drug importation, whatever package you want to talk about, and, and the evidence of that has uh, got them convicted. Yeah. And that, and that I, I think, is it. But, you know, somebody needs to listen to what I'm saying. Yeah, really needs to listen to what I'm saying. And, and, and I will personally come anywhere in the United Kingdom and brief them. Simple as that. So, you know, I two, I mean, over two years now, and I'm getting frustrated. Another sunny day in... ME 12, 2 and L, uh, and I ain't giving up, but it's hard work now. Give me a work card and I'll solve it over now. Thank you. <laughs> Albert, thank you ever so much for coming and sharing your, your answers with all those questions. Well, that's your part five in relation to what something else, I, the corruption side of it, uh, it, it needs. If, if they don't listen, yeah, then, then I, I will throw mud at the wall, and I don't want to do it. Yeah. But if they ain't listening and don't give me uh, some respect for the time I've spent on this, then the mud will be thrown at the wall. I hope you're listening. Very stern warning there. <laughs> Thank you, Albert. Much appreciated.